on this edition of Expose. Reporters connect big-time athletes to steroids. Uh, the only way you get any traction against the problem is exposing the drug sheets. Then the law comes after them. It's often not easy to stay rational about this whole thing, so I, I take it sort of personally that they're trying to put us in jail. <laughs> Funding for Expose has been provided by In the spring and summer of 2006, two journalists for the San Francisco Chronicle found themselves making the news instead of reporting it. They found themselves in a legal standoff about stories they'd published, which included information from confidential sources involved with grand jury testimony. Now they faced 18 months in jail for refusing to cooperate with a federal investigation. And it's unprecedented in the history of this country, legally and factually, the two reporters for breaking a very important and critical story would face that kind of jail time merely for failing to turn over their confidential sources. It did not involve national security. It did not involve terrorism. It involved America's favorite pastime. At the heart of the matter were baseball, a hometown hero, and one of the biggest scandals in American sports. It had started out in the least likely of places. In September 2003, federal agents raided a little-known nutritional supplements company in this San Francisco Bay Area office park. Mark Fainer Ruwada was assigned the story for the region's largest newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle. At first, no one knew if it was a story even because the government was saying nothing about the raids. I think the phrase they used was it was an enforcement action. Um, and then the, it was led by the IRS, so you wondered if it was a money case that really wasn't going to mean much or go anywhere. The company was known as the Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, or BELCO. Its owner, Victor Conti, had boasted of his close relationship with well-known sports figures, including San Francisco Giants star Barry Bonds. Bonds was a giant among giants in his hometown. In 2001, at 37, an age when most major leaguers are past their prime, Bonds broke the single-season home run record. Knowledgeable fans were in awe of his home run power, but they also noted that since his early days in the majors, Barry Bonds' body had undergone extraordinary physical changes. But rumors about his use of performance-enhancing drugs weren't enough to keep Giants loyalists from lining up to watch baseball history in the making. Those rumors, combined with a mysterious government raid, were enough to intrigue Fainer Ruwada, a veteran sports reporter. There were these high-profile athletes involved, um, and the question was, is the, was there a connection between the athletes and Balco, and was it a story? We got a tip within about two weeks of the raids from somebody who was familiar with what had gone on during the raids, and they said, look, this is a steroids case. Steroids were found during the raids. Bonds is going to be implicated. Uh, all these other athletes are going to be implicated for their use of the drugs. That's where the story's headed. And that obviously didn't get in the paper like that at that point, but it certainly ratcheted up the interest in the newsroom. Illegal to buy or sell without a prescription, anabolic steroids have been used for decades by athletes to enhance performance. If Belco was in fact a steroid mill, its owners would be subject to criminal prosecution, and at least some of its clients could face career-threatening sanctions. In October 2003, Lance Williams, a longtime investigative journalist, was asked to join in on the Balco story. Really, when I first came in, our boss, Steve Cook, said it was really only for a couple of stories. It was uh, a profile of Victor Conti, the head man at Balco, and then a profile of Greg Anderson, that was Barry Bond's trainer. And he thought each would take several weeks, help Mark with those. By that point, we ought to be pretty near done and I could get out. 
By now, a federal grand jury had begun investigating Balco's alleged steroid dealing. At the Philip Burton Federal Building in downtown San Francisco, prosecutors interviewed dozens of Balco's clients, among them Bonds, fellow baseball all-star Jason Giambi, and Olympic gold medalist track star Tim Montgomery. The appearance of Bonds, just named the National League's most valuable player for the third year in a row, raised the stakes and inspired a national dialogue that went all the way to Washington. The use of performance-enhancing drugs like steroids in baseball, football, and other sports is dangerous and it sends the wrong message. In January 2004, President Bush surprised many by raising the issue in his State of the Union address. So tonight I call on team owners, union representatives, coaches and players to take the lead, to send the right signal, to get tough and to get rid of steroids now. Three weeks later, then Attorney General John Ashcroft announced a 42-count indictment against Victor Conti, Greg Anderson and two other men. The reporters expected the indictments would finally reveal information they had been struggling to document for months. I thought if the government had evidence, as we thought they did, that all these elite athletes had used man drugs, that that was going to get laid out in the court papers at the time the indictments of the drug dealers came down. I was totally wrong about that. You know, the indictment day came down, and there were the four drug dealers' names, but if you went through the affidavits and the court record made public, uh, all the athletes' names were redacted or affidavits rewritten so their names didn't appear. What resonated with the public was, were these guys using, how long were they using, what were they using, and how did it affect their performance? On a higher level, if you talk to people who are interested in controlling sports doping, uh, the only way you get any traction against the problem is exposing the drug cheats. Whether these guys want to admit it, they're role models. Um, and the reality is there's clearly a trickle-down effect. If the message implicit or explicit from Major League Baseball or others is, you know what, we're going to accept this, the use of these drugs in sports, and it's just part of the deal, we just want to be entertained, then the message will be to teenagers that, hey, this is okay, this is what you need to do to compete, and so be it. That just can't be a good message. Well, it was a local story for us first and foremost, but it was clear to me really early on that interest in the story just transcended San Francisco. We were always worried about getting beaten. I can tell you, I always went to bed thinking we were going to get beat the next morning. We're the hometown paper for Balco, and if we got beat on it, it wasn't going to relieve us of the duties of covering it. And uh, we really didn't want to be in that situation where somebody came in from the outside and got the story before we did. But they couldn't just get the story first. They had to get it right. The paper's ground rule on the, on the Bond stories from the start was they were not going to write a story that said Barry Bonds used drugs according to informed sources. They just weren't going to do that. There was you know, essentially an edict from on high that these stories were going to need to be dead solid. They were going to need to rely heavily, you know, ideally in, in, a, in the best sense on documents. The holy grail of Balco documents was the grand jury transcript. Elite athletes discussing steroids and other performance enhancing drugs. The transcripts had been released to the Balco defendants and attorneys on both sides of the case. All signed a federal judge's protective order that barred them from leaking the athletes' words to the public. By early summer 2004, it seemed someone had violated that order. The Chronicle reporters had gotten hold of the grand jury testimony of at least one witness, Olympic gold medalist Tim Montgomery, whose world record in the 100-meter dash had earned him the title World's Fastest Man. We both looked at each other and thought, holy cow, we've got you know, this great story where this guy has publicly stated he's never used these drugs. Um, he's the 100-meter world record holder. And wait a minute, flat out, he admitted it to the grand jury that he used human growth hormone. Well, he described uh, Mr. Conti and a doctor that Conti had a relationship with writing phony prescriptions for stimulants for athletes. It was so eye-opening. And, uh, you know, it was just information you would never have been able to obtain uh, uh, from an interview situation or any other way. 
on june twenty fourth two thousand and four a front page article by lance williams and mark fainer a wada told the story of montgomery steroid use in the sprinters own words neither reporter would say how they got montgomery's testimony and by the end of the year they had received and quoted in the chronicle more of the secret transcripts including the testimony of baseball superstars jason giambi and barry bonds Giambi's statements included a stark admission that he had used steroids, while Bond's testimony was more ambiguous. In it, he described using products prosecutors believed to be steroids, though Bonds maintained he did not know that they contained illegal drugs. We knew the Bonds and Giambi stories were going to really hit hard, simply because Americans really care about baseball. Bonds is the home run king. This is his hometown. And we were, you know, delighted to have the opportunity to report on that true information. Giants fans didn't seem quite as delighted, and they still aren't. In fairness to Barry, I feel like when he went before the grand jury, he should have had the assumption of confidentiality. I think this whole thing from the start has pretty much been a witch hunt for, you know, kind of the star players, the highest profile players. Were we unpopular with some Giants fans as a result of this story? Absolutely. Some of the responses we got were quite um, Aggressive. Oh, I mean, it, it ranges from, you know, crawl back into the hole you, you, you know, crawled out of to you bleep and bleep and bleep and bleep. Believe me, and I'm a firm believer, if you want to maintain your illusions about things, people should maintain their illusions about things. You know, keep believing there's a Wizard of Oz. But, you know, I, I also believe, because I'm in this profession, and I believe in the profession that people ought to know, sometimes if it's just the guy behind the curtain and then they can keep believing in the wizard if they want. For years, Major League Baseball, unlike, say, the NFL or the International Olympic Committee, failed to implement tough penalties for players using performance-enhancing drugs. But less than two weeks after the Chronicle stories ran, detailing Bonds and Giambi's statements to the Balco grand jury, union representatives met with baseball owners to begin serious talks about cracking down on steroid use. And in a stunning turn of events, just six weeks after the Chronicle stories appeared, a new, stricter drug policy was in place. It's a story of a lifetime to have, have had a chance to cover. It's all been great, but the best thing about this is, you know, we actually were able to do a story that solicited change, which is like the dream of any sort of investigative reporter, I think, is that you would actually be doing work that would create some level of positive change. On March 17, 2005, four months after the Bonds and Giambi transcripts were published, the House Government Reform Committee held hearings on the abuse of steroids in baseball. Some of the sport's biggest names testified. Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Rafael Palmero. A month later, at the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner, the reporters were honored with an award in the presence of the president. During that, we did get to meet President Bush went over and introduced ourselves, and he knew us and knew our stories, and the first thing he said was, you've done a service. On July 15, 2005, Victor Conti and Bonds trainer Greg Anderson pled guilty to distributing steroids and money laundering. By then, Lance Williams and Mark fainer were at work on a book based on their reporting for the Chronicle. Game of Shadows was released in March 2006 and became an instant bestseller. But the effects of the reporting, quoting leaked grand jury testimony, would soon extend beyond baseball into the lives of the two reporters themselves. Government officials began looking into just how the transcripts made their way into the two reporters' possession. They wanted to prosecute whoever had leaked them. We thought certainly there would be interest on the part of the government in trying to track down the sources. We thought our story, being a sports story, not having national security ramifications or anything, we were relatively confident that we wouldn't get dragged into any leak investigation that would ensue. Look, we would love to have done all these stories without a single confidential source. It's just not the reality of the situation. This story was playing out in secret. You had documents that were shielded from the public view. And the whole point was to be able to try and get a hold of, of those documents to be able to reveal what was happening in secret. For a time, it appeared the two reporters would stay out of court. 
I was trying to remember that day. We were sitting in the office like we often are at our desks, and we got a call saying that Phil wanted to see us. And then we, you know, we walked in. He sat us down in the conference room, and he said, "You know, look, this is this is what's going on. Um, you know, we just got a call from Eve, and you know, we're the government's going to subpoena you guys." On May 5th, 2006, a U.S. attorney ordered the two Chronicle reporters to reveal their source for the leaked material. The move was endorsed by the Bush administration's top law enforcement official, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. There seems to be some disconnect when, you know, you've got the president talking about this in the State of the Union, and then we meet the president, and he tells us we performed a service, and then his administration turns around and issues subpoenas to us. The Chronicle moved to quash the subpoenas. Lawyers noted that reporters had broken no law by publishing the grand jury testimony. They also argued if someone had violated the judge's order by leaking the transcripts, it was nevertheless a minor crime, not worthy of upsetting the delicate balance between the government and the press. And if we lose this case legally, um, a vital component of the free flow of information in this country will have taken a hearty blow and the number of untold stories will increase and we may not know the effect of that to the country for over a decade until the law finds its way back to the center. Federal officials have refused to comment on the case, but former U.S. Attorney Joe Rasinello agrees with the government that forcing reporters to testify is necessary to ensure that lawbreakers are brought to justice. You have to understand that the focus of the prosecutor is really not on prosecuting the journalist for disclosing information that he or she obtained from a leaker, but rather to prosecute the leaker. On August 4, 2006, a federal judge heard arguments from the Justice Department and the Chronicle as to whether the government had overstepped its authority ordering the reporters to reveal their source. We've said we're not going to betray the sources, and we mean that, um, so that hasn't changed. But I think both Mark and I are optimistic. We have, a, we have great lawyers and uh, a strong case, and we're very hopeful about the <coughs> ultimate outcome here. We're, we're just not going to do anything that's going to compromise our sources. And, you know, as Lance said, I think we're hopeful that we're going to win on that. Well, the judge said whoever leaked the transcripts was involved in serious criminal conduct. He did not immediately rule on the reporter's request to throw out that subpoena that forces them to reveal their sources. But Dana, he did say his hands were tied by the U.S. Supreme Court precedent that is not on the side of journalists. In a 1972 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that reporters do not have the right to keep a source's identity confidential if called to testify before a grand jury. Justice Byron White wrote for the majority that there should be no special privilege extended to journalists. But Justice Lewis Powell, who voted with the majority, wrote a separate opinion saying judges should seek, quote, a proper balance between freedom of the press and the obligation of all citizens to give relevant testimony. It's often Powell's opinion that is cited when judges allow reporters to protect confidential sources. But a federal district judge tipped the balance in the government's favor on August 15, 2006, declaring there was a legitimate law enforcement need to compel the Chronicle reporters to testify. Five weeks later, on September 21st, the reporters were called into court again. Some breaking news now. A judge has just ordered two San Francisco Chronicle reporters to jail for not revealing the sources to their stories on the Balco steroid scandal. Good evening, Dana. This afternoon, after a three-hour court hearing, federal judge Jeffrey White ordered the two Chronicle reporters to jail for refusing to reveal sources who gave them sealed grand jury information about the steroid scandal. You know, I think you can sort of prepare yourself intellectually for the concept that this is what they're going to say to you and jail is where this is headed and all that. But when you actually, you know, are at this hearing, it's sort of an ominous kind of feeling in a moment. It's not a place I ever expected I would be in. And then to hear, you know, the, the judge flat out say, this is this is what I'm going to sentence, sentence you to, it, it has a sort of more dramatic effect than, than thinking about it. The judge's language, as I understand it, was to say, this is not to punish you, but it's to coerce you. Uh, the concept here is you hold the key to the jailhouse in your own pocket. You can free yourself anytime you want. Just comply with the order to give up the source. The option of betraying the sources is not 
part of the deal. I mean, you know, Lance said it perfectly in court the other day. It's not like we have a choice. We're adults, and we made promises, and we meant them, and the promise wasn't, uh, I'll protect you unless we get in a jam. It was, I'll protect you. To me, as difficult as this whole thing has been, the easiest part of the entire equation is, is the issue of not giving up the sources. I think it's foolish, but the fact of the matter is they're prepared to accept the consequence. That's fine. That's what, that's what you get. You get a consequence. I don't understand it. Uh, we weren't breaking any laws. We were calling people up on the phone and interviewing them and trying to get them to let us see documents. That's what I've been doing for 30 years. The lead dope dealer got four months in prison, and two of the guys didn't even go to prison. I would just ask the question for a truthful story that changed the face of baseball. Is this really something we want to put two reporters in jail for? I think they should go to prison, uh, whether or not they uh, release their sources or not, because they broke the sanctity of the grand jury. I really threatens our ability to get untainted news. Right now, news is very much a commodity, and who's, uh, who's bringing it? If, uh, if we start threatening people who are bringing us facts, uh, where does it end? I tend to be a little more excitable than Lance is. And, you know, naturally, this has enhanced my excitability a little bit. I think on a rational level, I don't necessarily take it personally, but it's often not easy to stay rational about this whole thing, so I... I take it sort of personally that they're trying to put us in jail. <laughs>
and lance williams have been threatened with jail sentences they are but a few names among many who have been subpoenaed for taking a stand for the first amendment and refusing to reveal confidential sources indiana republican congressman mike pence is sponsoring the bill his office tells expose he is hopeful there will be a vote this summer Expose has been provided by